Faith, for the existentialist, is a form of original sin. One is not born in it, to be sure, but it is so prevalent in the world that it is almost impossible to escape the contagion of bad faith. Bad faith is a lie to oneself. It is a form of self-deception. Sartre has formulated the concept as la mauvaise foi, it is his belief that most of us simply cannot bear the anguish of recognizing that we are free and that because we are free, we are responsible for whatever we have made of our lives. And so he says, we seek by any means possible to escape from the terror of this dreadful freedom by retreating into the serious world. The serious world is a world where everything is absolute. In it, each man is born into his rightful place. He has his own privileges, which are his due. He knows how to behave because all is defined. And values, too, are clear and absolute. Just as clearly marked as articles on a bargain table, each one with its own price. But in reality, Sartre says, we are not living in a serious world. In reality, our position is more like that of a player in a game. He has consented to acknowledge the stakes as worthwhile. He has agreed to abide by the rules, but he knows very well that nothing from outside the game forces him to be there or to choose these rules. And consequently, at any moment, he realizes, he could change the rules of his game, alter the stakes, or choose another game entirely. In this sense, we find that man is not identical with the role that he plays. Sartre has exploited this in a drama known as Keen. Edmund Keen, the Shakespearean actor, has apparently ruined his career the night before by shouting abuses at the Prince of Wales, who was sitting in the audience. Governor, if, if I tell them you're in your right mind, they'll put you in prison. Prison? Because I'm in my right mind? What a world. Very well, then, I shall go to prison. If you go to prison, you'll never act again. What a fate. Oh, Governor, you mustn't let him. What do you want me to do? Well, if you'd only... Just for a day or two. What? Pretend. To? Yes. Solomon. Well, you were magnificent in Lear. Lear. My dear fellow, even if I wanted to, it would be impossible. I can never act again. You can never? Since when? Since last night. I've been thinking. To act, one must take oneself as someone else. I thought I was Keen, who thought he was Hamlet, who thought he was Fortinbras. But Hamlet... Yes, Hamlet does think he's Fortinbras. <laughs> Shh! It's a secret. <laughs> what a series of misunderstandings. Fortinbras doesn't think he is anyone. Fortinbras and Mr. Edmund are alike. They know who they are, and they say only what is. You can ask them about the weather, 
the time of day, the price of bread, but never try to make them act on a stage. What's the weather like? Can't you see? The sun is shining. Is that your sun? I shall have to grow accustomed to it. Keen sun was painted on a stage canvas. Solomon, the London sky is a painted cloth. Every morning you open the curtains. I opened my eyes and I saw, I don't know what I saw. And the man himself is a sham, everything is a sham around him. Under a sham son, the sham keen cried the tale of his sham sufferings to his sham heart. Today the sun is real. How flat real light is! Truth should be blinding, dazzling. It's true. It's true. I am a ruined man. I shall wait for the police here. That's uh, Richard III's chair. In this very chair. When you go, leave the street door wide open. I want the police to have free access. Like the Gauls invading the Roman Senate? Who told you I was thinking of that? It was in the new play you gave me to read. Oh my God. You are right. I am making a gesture. Do you know my whole life is composed of nothing but gestures. There is one for every hour, every season, every period of my entire life. I learn to walk, to breathe, to die. Now at last those gestures are dead, like so many dead branches. I killed them all last night at one blow. I will root them out, and if I cannot, I will cut off my arms! <laughs> Do you hear? Do you hear? Oh, Maltebank. You are going to lead a hard life. You must learn to be simple. Perfectly simple. Arrgh! Out of my life or I will kill you! No. Stay. You do not incommode me. No. You see, the man in the armchair was not me, it was Richard III. And that one is Shylock. Oh well, it will have to happen by degrees. I will imitate the natural <laughs> until it becomes second nature. As an actor, Keane can perhaps see the human situation a little more clearly than the rest of us. For as he watches himself playing his roles, it is as though he looked into a series of mirrors, finding image upon image, and then discovering that he cannot decide which is the real Keane. The answer, of course, for the existentialist is that there is no real Keane. 
For one cannot say of a man that he is anything in the way that the tree is a tree or a table is a table. There is, as it were, a little film of nothingness between a man and his acts. And here, according to Sartre, is where bad faith enters in. It is just, says Sartre, as though man shifted back and forth between two meanings of the verb to be. In the past, one was what one was. In other words, a man was what his acts made him be. But in the present and the future, then the situation is different. Facing the past, the man in bad faith will attempt to say that he isn't really what his acts would seem to have made him. For example, I have, let's say, cheated on my income tax, pocketed a few extra items in the supermarket, and yet I declare I am not a thief, for I do not have the nature of a thief. Now such bad faith is easy to detect, but what about sincerity itself? This may be a trap, it may prove to be a form of bad faith. For suppose a person says, I am an evil person, I am hostile to society, I am an outcast, and since I am a criminal or a thief, there's no point in my trying to be anything else, for this is what I am and I can't change it. This becomes perhaps a more serious form of bad faith, the seeming sincerity, than the insincerity. Now, one might recall the old story of the man who was made to feel by an old-fashioned minister that he was totally evil and depraved. As the limerick puts it, at Ipswich, when the preacher had quit it, a young man said, ah, now I've hit it. Since nothing is right, I'll go out tonight, find the best sin and commit it. But bad faith is not just an attitude toward oneself. It involves also an attitude toward others. In general, we may say that bad faith consists in accepting absolutely the customs and the outlook of the society around one, as though it were absolutely true for eternity. And more than this, it consists in identifying a man with some accident of his situation, his social situation, his religion, his race, or what he happens to have done in the past. Simone de Beauvoir, in her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, discusses bad faith in connection with a society with oppressed and oppressors. It is common, she says, for the oppressors to deny the oppressed education and everything which would help lift them above the level of sub-men. And then the oppressors look around them and say, but can I possibly be on an equal basis with such animals as these? In prejudice, one can see most easily of all the structure of bad faith. The prejudiced man pins all others than himself to some accident of birth or religion or situation. And then he feels that he has, in contrast, a position which cannot be assailed. No matter what he does, he does not have to win his place in the sun. He is what he is. He has the impenetrability of a rock. Sartre says, that no man is ever simply an anti-Semite or an anti-Negro, for example, but that anti-Semitism or one of the other prejudices is not an opinion. One can't change the prejudiced man by showing him an array of facts so that he will modify his opinion. But prejudice is a global attitude, and the man who is prejudiced in one respect will be prejudiced in every other respect, for what he fears is the truth about man, that he is what he makes himself. And consequently, he wants to keep men always attached to some mere accidental property of their being. We can see an especially amusing example of this in Sartre's play, Nekrasov. In one scene, a thief has been caught in the apartment of a very respectable householder. See below, the man of the house has just called the police. Do I look like a murderer? What a misunderstanding. I admire you, and you think I want to cut your throat. I admire you. 
Let me look at the honest man in his full and splendid majesty. Suppose I were to tell you that I tried to kill myself just now in order to escape my pursuers. Don't try to get around me. Splendid. And suppose I were to take a vial from my pocket, swallow the contents, and drop dead at your feet. Well? What would you say? I'd say the rogue had saved the law a job. The quiet certitude of an irreproachable conscience. It is easy to see, sir, that you have never entertained the slightest doubt about what is right. Of course. And that you don't subscribe to those subversive doctrines which hold the criminal to be a product of society? A criminal is a criminal. Splendid. A criminal is a criminal. That's well said. Ah, sir, there's no danger that I touch your heart by telling you the story of my unfortunate childhood. It would do you no good. I had a tough childhood myself. And little you'd care that I'm a victim of the First World War, the Communist Revolution, and the capitalist system. There are others who are victims of all that. Me, for example, and who don't stoop to thieving. You have an answer for everything. Nothing saps your convictions. Ah, oh, sir, with that bronze forehead, those enamel eyes, and that heart of stone. You must be an anti-Semite. I should have known it. Are you a Jew? <laughs> no, sir, no. And I'll admit to you that I share your anti-Semitism. Don't be offended. Share is going too far. Let's say I pick up the crumbs. Not having the good fortune to be honest, I don't enjoy your assurance. I have doubts, sir. I have doubts. That is the prerogative of troubled souls. I am, if you like, an aspiring anti-Semite. What about the Arabs? You hate them, don't you? That's enough. I have neither the time nor the inclination to listen to your nonsense. I ask you to go back into this room immediately and to wait there quietly until the police arrive. I'll go. I'll go back in the other room. But just tell me that you hate the Arabs. Yes. Say it better than that, just to please me. And I'll swear to you, it's my last question. They are to stay where they belong. Wonderful. Sir, I take off my hat to you. You are honest to the point of ferocity. After this brief tour of the horizon, our identity of views is plain which doesn't surprise me. What honest people we scoundrels would be if your police would give us the chance. In such obvious examples as this, it may be difficult to see how bad faith can be even self-deception. But more often the patterns of bad faith are more insidious. The most subtle of all, perhaps, is in a book by Albert Camus called The Fall. The title is applied ironically to the self-recognition of its hero. Clemence was a brilliant defense attorney and then at the height of his professional and social success he felt that everything was undermined as he had come gradually to see that all of his loudly proclaimed love of humanity, all of his many acts of altruism, were simply manifestations of self-interest, of self-love. And so he gave it all up and went to a bar at the side of the sea, grabbing hold of anyone he could find to listen to him and launching into a long monologue of denunciation. In part, this was an attack against the whole human race. And Clemence listed, rather gleefully, all of the crimes and atrocities of humankind. And sometimes he became more subtle, pointing out, for example, our inability to love. Have you noticed, he said, 
that death alone awakens our feelings, how we love the friends who have just left us, how we admire those of our teachers who have ceased to speak, their mouths filled with earth. Then the expression of admiration springs forth naturally. That admiration they were perhaps expecting from us all their lives. But do you know why we are always more just and more generous toward the dead? The reason is simple. With them, there is no obligation. They leave us free and we can take our time fit the testimonial in between a cocktail party and a nice little mistress in our spare time. If they forced us to anything, it would be to remembering. And we have a very short memory. No, it is the recently dead we love among our friends. The painful dead. Our emotion. Ourselves, after all. That's the way man is, my friend. He has two faces. He can't live without self-love. But Clemence's denunciation is not just of mankind in general. As he goes on, he goes more and more into the nature of a personal confession, showing how gradually in his life in Paris, he had discovered that every single act was really but one more stone in the monument of self-pride. The crisis, he said, occurred one night as he stood on the bridge over the Seine. From a distance he heard muffled cries for help. And out of fear of danger, and even more, dislike of the necessary discomfort involved, he failed to jump in and save the drowning woman. Then the image shattered, and he fled from Paris to his bar and his listening victim. I have been practicing my useful profession here for some time. It consists, to begin with, as you know from experience, in indulging in public confession as often as possible. I accuse myself up and down, covered with ashes, tearing my hair, my face scored with clawing, but with piercing eyes I stand before all humanity, recapitulating my shames without losing sight of the effect I am producing and saying, I, I was the lowest of the low." When I get to, this is what we are, the trick's been played and I can tell them off. However, I'm like them, to be sure. We're in the soup together. However, I have a superiority in that I know it. And this gives me the right to speak. You see the advantage, I'm sure. The more I accuse myself, the more I have a right to judge you. Even better, I provoke you into judging yourself, and this relieves me of that much of the burden. <laughs> oh, we are odd, wretched creatures. And if we simply look back over our lives, there's no lack of occasions to amaze and horrify ourselves. Just try. I shall listen, you may be sure, to your own confession with a great feeling of fraternity. Are we not all alike, constantly talking and to no one? Forever up against the same questions, although we know the answers in advance. Then please tell me what happened to you one night on the keys of the Seine, and how you managed never to risk your life, you, yourself. Utter the words that for years have never ceased echoing through my nights, that I shall at last say through your mouth. Oh, young woman, throw yourself into the water again that I may a second time have the chance of saving both of us. 
a second time. What a risky suggestion. Just suppose, sir, that we should be taken literally. We'd have to go through with it. <laughs> the water is so cold. <laughs> but let's not worry. It's too late now. It shall always be too late. Fortunately. The question is whether Clemence at long last really is in good faith or not. Whether his grim self-portrait is as he intended, the proper mirror of all mankind. Some critics have said that it is, and that Camus for his part in this book has pronounced his own condemnation of men, and that he is confessing the failure of humanism. One writer has gone so far as to say that the only logical step for Camus would have been to retreat into the church and to confess his need for divine grace, that man cannot go it alone. But this is not what Camus did, and he has made it very clear that these are not the correct interpretations of the fall. There are two things which destroy mankind, he said. The first is that conventional self-righteousness, which, in the name of the easily established morality of society, would pass dreadful judgments against men. And the other is cynicism, which, holding up before man some non-human standard of perfection, would deny to him any of his weaker aspirations for good. Camus says that his hero, with his guilty conscience, with his sense of sin, represents the attitude in Europe which has condemned mankind finally, which ends up by killing and by putting men into concentration camps. This would mean that Clemence actually represented both of the attitudes, both the self-complacent virtue in what we might call his days of grace and the cynicism at the time of his fall. Camus says, I detest virtue that is only smugness. I detest the frightful morality of the world. And I detest it because it ends just like absolute cynicism, in demoralizing men and in keeping them from running their own lives with their own just measures of meanness and of magnificence. Perhaps we may say that good faith consists in accepting men in spite of their evil, for the sake of their potential good. If this is true, then bad faith is any device which either pretends that the meanness is not there in man, or that we should, for any reason whatsoever, give up our never-ending struggle to attain the magnificence. from Necrosoft by Jean-Paul Sartre was translated by Sylvia and George Lafon. The scene from Sartre's Keen was translated by Kitty Black. Both works are published by Alfred A. Knopf under the title The Devil and the Good Lord and two other plays. <laughs>